to know. All right, good morning. Uh, my name's Sam, and I'll be presenting uh, basically Okazaki fragments in a longer title up there. So let me introduce myself for those of you guys who haven't met me yet, other than that strange guy in your classroom. So that's me, um, Oregon native. Uh, I spent six years um, in the Navy, as that's kind of my interpretation of that. Uh, I am post back. I have my Bachelor of Science in Nuclear Engineering Technology. Um, so I'm post back pursuing microbiology right now, and that last fact's true. We can go with that. Okay, um, so kind of an overview of what we're going to be going over today. Um, we're going to start off actually with what we know today and kind of go in reverse. Uh, so a quick review on that. Um, what did Dr. Okazaki know before he started his experiment, or what was the general consensus at the time? Um, what were his findings? Kind of a spoiler. Talk about his methods, um, some of his interpretation, a little biography of Dr. Okazaki at the end, and hopefully, if I'm not spending too much time, kind of a timeline and a video. So this is a review of Okazaki fragments. And so polymerase only works in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. Most of us know this. At the time, they did, it was still questionable. Uh, but basically, the lagging strand up here forms a primer. Um, then you have polymerase comes in and synthesizes it in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. Uh, you remove the, the primer fragment. You seal the nick with some ligase, and that's how you form the lagging strand. And then the leading strand is just one continuous process all the way down the chain, I think. Know that. And so this is the replosome and everything that's going on in the replosome. Um, we have the helicase that's spinning super fast. They say it spins as fast as a turbine engine, which I think is really cool. Um, some primase. And then this is actually where the action is going on as far as we're concerned. This is the lagging uh, strand is getting synthesized by DNA polymerase in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. And kind of a question of why does it only go in one direction? And the reason that it does this is because polymerase does have proofreading ability, which I think is incredible. And if you went in the opposite direction, so this on the right is kind of showing the actual growth and what's happening, and pretty much this green element right here, this um, green section, was a mistake. And so the idea is polymerase comes along, excises that mistake, and then it actually still has energy left because of the, um, the phosphodiester bond is still lacking in that, in that area, so it's able to synthesize that back together. If you went the other direction, what would happen is you would excise this piece that was a mistake. You wouldn't have um, available energy to actually continue synthesis, and you would just stop synthesis altogether. So anytime you made a mistake, it would be pretty much game over. And so that's what we're showing right there. And so moving on to where we are with Dr. Okazaki. So the year is, eh, he published in 1967. It's really 1966. Uh, other things that were going on in 1966 was this show uh, actually started up, which I think is pretty cool. So, yeah, so Batman started off in 1966. They started filming. Pretty exciting stuff. <laughs> And this is actually a really cool experiment that happened. It was published about a year before Dr. Okazaki. And at the time, they knew that there was this replication fork going on. And what happened is Dr. Huberman and his cohorts managed to do this very lengthy experiment. Long story short, they, in a pretty ingenious way, they labeled DNA, but they labeled some of it at a higher activity than others. It was a pulse chase, but some of the DNA is getting labeled at high activity. That's the dark band here. I've actually kind of altered the picture so it shows up on the screen a little, be a little bit better. In the actual picture, you can almost make out these kind of in-between marks, but it's really, really kind of hard to see because it's a scan of an old, old paper. But uh, they basically did a pulse chase with a lesser activity radionucleotide, and then went back to the other nucleotide. And by doing this and exposing it, I don't know if you guys saw this, but for seven and a half months, they had to develop this, this photograph, which is absolutely incredible and an amount of patience that just has me in awe. But um, all they knew was that there was this replication fork. And this experiment, which happened a year before, like I said, they actually did notice that both both strands were getting replicated at the same time. However, they did notice that one was going in the opposite direction of the other, which is really interesting. So at the time, there was a lot of knowledge coming on at the same time, but there was also this kind of embarrassment that was going on. They knew this replication fork was going on, but they really didn't have an idea of all the mechanisms that were occurring. And this interesting cartoon got drawn up, which is kind of fascinating. And 
Uh, Dr. Kornberg, which we're going to be hearing about later today, um, who discovered polymerase and did a whole bunch of research regarding the replication fork, actually came across this and didn't have some nice things to say. He says he found this cartoon depicting our ignorance of the molecular machinery of the replication fork, which has been discreetly covered by a fig leaf. And I was not pleased, according to Dr. Kornberg. So that's pretty interesting. And so here was the hypothesis. So Dr. Okazaki, going into this experiment, figured that there was probably four different uh, ways that we could be replicating. We could say, in figure A, maybe we just haven't found this other polymerase that's able to go in this backwards fashion. Maybe it does exist. They didn't really think it was likely, but throw it up there anyway. Um, in figure B, we're going to go ahead and say that the leading strand is continuous and the lagging strand replicates in fragments, which we know today is what actually occurs. Uh, part C, maybe they both kind of go in, in sections. And then part D, I'm not really sure where this came from, but they even thought maybe you disconnect everything altogether and then ligase it back together at the end. I'm not really sure why he had that idea and he didn't really say a whole lot about it, but noteworthy anyways. So his overall method was relatively simplistic. He basically had a couple of different um, model organisms that he slowed the DNA synthesis in by chilling. Uh, specifically, he talks about E. coli that he cools down to from normal 37 degrees down to, I believe, around 20 degrees C. Um, and he got really lucky in not only the organism he selected, but the temperature. It turns out that with a five-second pulse at this temperature, you hit right around 1,000 to 2,000 nucleotides in length, which he didn't know at the time was about the length of an Okazaki fragment in some systems. Um, and then what he did is he did a pulse chase experiment with uh, radioactively labeled thiamine. And then he stopped DNA synthesis at a variety of times. Then he separated out DNA from the cell contents, measured the sedimentation rates, which we'll talk about a little more in detail in a second. And he compared the rates of sedimentation over time. So as far as the sedimentation rates, I found this concept relatively confusing. So we're going to talk about it for just a minute. So the sedimentation rate, this is a little bit different than we've talked about previously. So uh, previously we've said, okay, we're going to use a, a solution where we come to equilibrium, right? Like you just spin it for long enough and the different molecules, the different weights are going to find their, their space in the, uh, in the tube. In this case, they're using a sucrose solution, but you can see it's a gradient sucrose. So it's actually um, more, more sucrose at the bottom than it is at the top. And the idea is that if you're using all of the same stuff, in this case DNA, and if you treat it with alkaline, they're all going to be relatively clumped. And the only thing that's going to change where they are position-wise is their size alone. And so this is where the Spedberg units come out. And the, he bases that calculation off of um, a kind of a reference particle. And so the idea is the bigger the particle, the longer it travels. So in the paper, it mentions faster sedimentating or sedimentation rate. That's talking about the heavier pieces. They're going faster as they go down here. But the key to this experiment is it's all about timing. You don't just get to spin it forever and then see what happens. You have to spin it for a certain amount of time. And they're traveling the entire time they're going down here. And what's really interesting is the amount of time they spent doing this. Uh, in the paper, he mentions spending up to about 17 and a half hours in some cases at, I believe, like 20 or 40,000 RPM to get the results that he wanted. So very long time to get the sedimentation that he wants. And this is actually the machine that he used. Um, they were definitely a fan of hyperbole in here. I don't know if I can read that text. But it's fantastic. It's mul what is it? Multiplied by the performance, the conventional centrifuge by 20, and you have a centrifugal wallop that can accompany. Not it's great. It's fantastic advertising. But this is actually, you can't really see it on the slide, but this is actually the model he used. Um, apparently, it was capable of a lot of G-force. And I looked it up recently, ultra centrif centrifugation uh, seems to top out at somewhere around 2 million Gs, which blows my mind. Apparently, if you just want just the titanium capsule alone, you're going to spend a couple thousand dollars, let alone the rest of the machine. Not a machine I would want to stand around personally. Um, and then with his radioactively labeled um, thiamines, he counted them. And so what he did that, excuse me, how he counted them was with the scintillation detector. And scintillation, if some of you are unfamiliar, is you have a radionucleotide and it undergoes um, 
decomposition, it's going to give off a particle. And the thing with scintillation is you're actually counting every single particle that comes into place. It's, it's through a photomultiplier too. But you're not measuring it as a proportional rate. You're actually saying that was exactly one count. That's exactly one count. It's a very precision machine. So being able to do this, and I'm not sure if this is the exact model he used. This is about the time era of machine that he should be using, but just for historical note. And so let's get on to some of his results. Um, these graphs are kind of difficult to look at, but basically what we're looking at is this is distance from the top. So this means heavier items are down towards this end, lighter items are over here, and the amount of it is how much on your peak. So if you look at the different amount of seconds, that's how long he pulsed each uh, sample for. So in this case, I believe we're talking about uh, E. coli B, which is just a regular strain of E. coli. And based off of the amount of counts, he's saying, hey, I pulsed it for five seconds. I got a little bit. So we're looking at the lighter fragments. These are the Okazaki fragments in, in theory, right? And the longer I pulsed it, this didn't really change a whole lot, but the amount of these fragments did change. So we've got a couple more slides that will make this hopefully a little more evident. So this is more of E. coli B, which I believe this one's rated labeled with carbon-14. He doesn't really discuss why he goes back and forth between using carbon-14 and tritium, he, but he does, which is interesting. I'm assuming, because he used the carbon-14 for the really long pulse, I'm assuming because of the half-life, that's why he used uh, the carbon-14 in some and not the others. So he used this in a variety of, of organisms. So E. coli 15T are very sensitive to thiamine deprivation. The reason he did this is he wanted to make sure what he's pulsing it with is actually going to incorporate it in the molecule. So without any thiamine, this thing is just not going to replicate at all. So all of his label is getting incorporated. And again, this is the same kind of trend, the same kind of graph. You see a whole lot of fragments forming right here, and then a lot of the heavier fragments don't really seem to change. And so... Another model that he used is a wild type that has a mutation that leads them to death. Same kind of idea. If they don't get thiamine, they're just going to perish. So he's making sure that these are actually getting incorporated as it's being synthesized. This graph is actually, or no, this is from this experiment. This kind of labels it a little bit clearer. So you can see these are the short DNA pieces right here, and then the longer DNA pieces here. And they all pretty much settle out to about the same after a certain amount of time. So what we're saying is that the more I pulse, excuse me, kind of getting ahead of myself, um, these DNA fragments seem to be, you have to forgive me, this is the one I was looking for, okay. So this is actually his later experiment, and what he did in this case is they had heard of this ligase enzyme, and he really had a good idea what was going with it, so he redid this experiment, and this time with a model that didn't have a ligase that worked, and because of this, you're never going to ligate the, um, the, the strands together. So when you lyse these organisms, you're going to get basically nothing but these short fragments because they've never been stitched together. So the idea on these previous slides was that these are segments that are getting ligated together later. And if you don't ligate them together, just going to stay as short segments, and you'll get something more that looks like this. Um, and then later, he actually was... Um, came full circle as far as his verification of what he was doing, and he was asking, these, um, what I'm getting out of my hydroxyapatite, is this actually DNA? And he verified this by actually using DNA ACE to basically split up the material that he was getting out of this experiment. And these numbers are shown in per percentage of what's actually getting denatured. So he's saying, okay, is this... Um, is this material that I'm working with, is this actually DNA? And so he exposed it to DNA ACE, and it degraded, and then he exposed it to um, protein-degrading enzymes, and nothing happened. So he was really sure that this was DNA. So his interpretation of the results is kind of interesting. Um, he concludes that the replication is non-continuous, which is true, um, but he believes this happened in both strands. And he actually is quote from the paper, the replication mechanism by which only one of the two daughter strands is synthesized discontinuously is less likely because virtually all the label is recovered in the slowly sedimenting component after the very short pulse. So what he's saying is we got all of these short fragments and we didn't get any like, these longer fragments. And he, later he admits, well, maybe this is just a, um, a side effect of the experimental process. Maybe I'm accidentally forming NICs and splitting it up on accident later. And later he finds this is true. And he has one of the 
One of my favorite figures of, all, of any paper we've come across so far is uh, figure nine, which is a schematic illustration of a possible structure of dotted strand in the vicinity of the growing end, which is not the most elaborate drawing I've ever seen in my life, but it's pretty fantastic. And he's basically saying, okay, we start with these short fragments, they get ligated together slowly but surely, and then they become part of the dotted strand. So that was the experiment in a nutshell. And this is Dr. Okazaki. Um, he actually worked under Dr. Kornberg in his lab and then moved back to Japan where he did this experiment in his hometown. Um, so he repeated it. <laughs> so from the, from the book by Dr. Kornberg, he actually quotes the Okazaki maneuver as repeating a tedious procedure that is known to work several hundred times instead of working in bulk. And basically what he's saying is like he wanted to expand some of the experiments he was doing and he had learned how to do it in, in the micro scale. And then he needs to do it and say going from microliters to liters of substance. And instead of just reinventing the process and doing it in bulk, he would actually just repeat that process that he knows worked and do that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times to get what he wants instead of doing it in bulk. And originally, Dr. Kornberg kind of criticized him for this, and then he had another student who tried to make that leap straight to doing it in a bulk process, and it was a disaster. So he said, oh, just try and do the Okazaki maneuver. It'll work for you if you have patience. So the fragments were discovered at Nagoya University, and unfortunately, he died of leukemia at age 45. Um, depending on what reference you look at, they presume this was from the unfortunate um, reality that his hometown was in uh, Hiroshima, which was bombed during World War II. And while searching for his parents, it's possible that he had a lot of radiation exposure. Um, statistically, that's unlikely. And the reason I say that is because his likelihood of dying from leukemia wasn't uh, any more or less likely than the general population. So it's generally believed that it was just he got leukemia from another source other than Hiroshima. So this is the university where he uh, did the discovery of Okazaki fragments. And I'm going to jump real quick. This is kind of a timeline. We're about a third of the way through the class or so, and I found this really great um, kind of representation of where we are. So looking at it in this perspective, it's kind of amazing how much discovery has happened in a very short amount of time. So this is from the Human Genome Project. This whole blue section is just talking about the Human Genome Project itself abbreviated HGP, and then we're going to start over here. Got a quick end. We're going to zoom in in just a second. So we're talking with Mendel over here, and all the way up to about 2003, if you can't read that right there. So let's see if I can keep up with the animation. So this is starting at the very beginning, Mendel's discovery of the law of genetics in 1865, rediscovery of his work in 1900, as we talked about earlier. Um, we have the concept of human inborn errors and metabolism. 1905, so this is barely 100 years ago. So going really fast, we have the first linear map of genes, Avery McLeod McCarty, Watson and Crick, 1953, barely over 50 years ago. Um, Holly determined the genetic code. We got recombinant DNA technology only in the 70s. Um, sequencing me methods in 77. My birth year, you got the database coming up right there. Um, DNA maps, uh, first discussion talking about the human genome, 1984, not a long time ago. Moving on, first automated DNA sequencing equipment, first generation of human genetic map. Um, the organization, the Hugo, was actually formed. And look at this, 1990 to 2003, start and human genome project. It's pretty incredible. And finishing off with kind of a bonus video, this is from um, Cell Bio or from the media from Cell Bio. You know the CDs they come with? Save them. Great material. So this is, it's just a really great anima animation. I'm sure most of you guys have seen this, but I think it's pretty fantastic. Using computer animation based on molecular research, we are able to picture how DNA is replicated in living cells. You are looking at an assembly line of miniature biochemical machines that are pulling apart the DNA double helix and cranking out a copy of each strand. The DNA to be copied enters the production line from bottom left. The whirling blue molecular machine is called a helicase. It spins the DNA as fast as a jet engine as it unwinds the double helix into two strands. One strand is copied continuously and can be seen spooling off to the right. Things are not so simple for the other strand because it must be copied backwards. It is drawn out repeatedly in loops and copied one section at a time. 
The end result is two new DNA molecules. So I'll torture you that too much longer. I think that's a really, really, really great animation of what everything's going on. And that is all I have. <laughs> Any questions? when you presented them better than I have ever before. Very awesome. good job. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I noticed on the paper it talks about the uh, Thomas procedure. Yes. Um, I was curious. I like that. I'm not really sure what the Thomas procedure is, so I was wondering if you I was also very that. curious and spent a few hours trying to look up the so-called Thomas procedure or anything related to it. I was unable to find that procedure, anything that alluded to that procedure at all. So unless Dr. Stedman can enlighten us what that might be, I unfortunately don't have an answer for you. No idea, but I'd have to go and try and find the papers probably. Unfortunately, the reference that he uses, I think it's reference 10 or something, um, references just the quote-unquote Thomas procedure. It doesn't really reference a paper per se, so it's really difficult to find out what exactly he's talking about. Any questions I can hopefully answer? If I remember correctly from the paper, uh, he, all, he does a couple of different experiments. He's got the denaturing and non denaturing so alkaline and then the neutral sucrose gradients. You maybe go back to I forget which ones they are. Maybe you could look at them and sort of what the difference is, what we're looking at there. Let's see here. I believe he did all the sedimentation rates in alkali solution. And it mentions the reason he does alkali and sucrose gradient is supposedly my understanding is that it coagulates each of the molecules of interest. So the, the only thing you're looking at in the sedimentation rate is just the size. It's not any other interactions going on. So I didn't find, so this is alkaline sucrose. Oops. Alkaline, alkali, alkali, alkali. So I'm not sure if there's another figure. I thought there was one that was neutral, but again, I could be, I could be wrong on that. Maybe he did it for another part. I'm not sure. So why use viruses other than the fact that they're just totally cool? <laughs> so my understanding, so later he used a virus, um, I believe that, this is, I'm going to say something incorrect. Um, I know he used a virus later that lacked ligase. He did that in experiment two, and that's actually, this, this, this graph that comes was your from. That next one, yeah. Yeah. So that's where this one comes from. And it's also, during the lytic cycle, there's going to be a lot of replication going on just before the cell lyses. So it's going to be really rapid um, DNA activity occurring at that time. What about the, the previous slide? Why use it for that? Uh, my, my presumption was simply the, the same, just that there's a lot of uh, DNA replication occurring at that time. That's all that I got out of it other than he wanted to use a couple of different models. He mentions he got a, a gift from one of his other uh, cohorts and was very thankful for that. And he used the wild type um, and the E. coli B. So I'd imagine it's just to have a couple of different um, models to work from. Maybe. Maybe if you go back a slide now. What about the next slide? A few more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, think, I think a lot of this has to do with the amounts, really. And you're exactly right. You're getting a lot more replication happening. Many, many more replication forks than you have in the yeah, E. coli genome. How many do we have, usually? A few. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anyone else? So the, how many, how many would you normally have in a regularly growing E. coli? It's actually usually considerably more than that, but um, that's because they're multiple following each other. But in theory, you just need two. Okay. Can you go back to the models real quick? The pure one, his models. Oops. 
I don't think I have figure one on here. Oh, yes, I do. There. So which which one which one did he end up liking? He ended up liking figure D, um, although he did admit that this nick that's occurring down here was from his experimental process, maybe not occurring naturally. But he did conclude that this this was the form of replication that was occurring, which was different than what was actually occurring, but he still got the Nobel Prize for it, I believe, anyways. He did mention it was hard to, you couldn't really differentiate, but he was so sure it was this because you were only, so let's see here, if, if this was the model that was occurring, you would have, some of these would get ligated together and they would get longer and longer and longer. But what was happening is he was recovering almost all of his label, so that meant he was getting all of these short sections back. None of it was getting incorporated into another strand or a longer segment. So that's why he was pretty sure this was happening instead of this, because what would happen is this would grow into, a, into another unlabeled part, get ligated together, and not it would set him out at a lower fraction. But because he found all of it pretty much together, this is why he was sure this was happening. And then he goes on to admit that maybe this is still kind of fragile after um, replication in the ligase activity, so maybe that's why it's falling apart easier. To answer your question. Um, I'm actually a little unclear. Um, is there just one replication fork then, or are there two? I believe in E. coli there has to be at least two. And is a leading strand just a leading strand all the way through, or is it a lagging strand? So it'll be the leading strand on the one side and the lagging at the other fork, and then vice versa. So is that a possible explanation for discontinuous replication on both strands? I really hadn't thought of it like that, possibly. So you're saying... Is it, oops. You're saying at this replication fork, so maybe we're going like this and like this, and then this is the semi-continuous, semi-continuous, uh, like that? Yeah, I wasn't sure. Does that apply, though, for this system? I, th I think so. I don't, I don't know if that would explain his results any differently. I was wondering if that was, that does, I was wondering if that does explain why, where is it? The mechanism by which two daughter strains are synthesized discontinuously, and I guess because in that case, then there's discontinuous synthesis on both strands as well as continuous. Oh, you're saying here? Uh huh. And here? Yeah, but I just I wasn't sure if Oops, I was. Those arrows are pay no attention to the arrow direction. <laughs> <laughs> that way. That way. No, I'm not really sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I can't I think I think my my understanding of it again is it's really exactly as you said. He just wasn't recovering these big fragments because if you think about the experiment, you should be getting the big leading strand. There should be just an accumulation of this really big piece of labeled DNA, and he just wasn't seeing it. So I think that's the reason that he has to invoke one of these things where it's really discontinuous. But anybody who's worked with big pieces of DNA knows that it's actually pretty hard to get them without at least some breakage in them. 